Man, do you hear that? Look at here. They're coming. They're coming. We're going to have a party. All right, guys. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is Chad Ward, and welcome to the Good Old Boy Podcast. Today's guest, I've got my man, Luke Darnell from Old Virginia Smoke. Luke, how you doing today, brother? I'm great, Chad. How are you, man? Man, I am doing awesome, brother. It is good to uh, connect with you. I know the last couple times we talked, it's been over there on your podcast, which was a ton of fun. Happy to get you on early in the cycle here, the Old Boy Podcast. Absolutely. I'm very excited. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, my friend. And it's also a pleasure to share a drink with you. Got a little of this 5'9 whiskey here, and it's delicious. I'm going to tell you, man, I'm, I've been enjoying it, and I'm glad you got to try. But, uh, yeah, it's it's super tasty, and uh, and I, I really like it. Nice and smooth, and uh, at a good price point, too. And folks will be able to find that out there real, real soon. So talk to me a little bit. You know, I, I want to go back a little bit. This may be, for some of our listeners, first time they've heard from Luke Darnell. Let's talk a little bit about competition barbecue, what got you into it. And, uh, and like the majority of us, we all had a little bit of a life before barbecue and we found this passion and we started taking up all of our free time doing it. And then lo and behold, it becomes our profession. Not a bunch of us that have got to do it, but it seems like a lot more in this last quote unquote generation of competition barbecue cooks, you know, used to, there were just a handful of guys from that. You know, I would say, you know, you, you had a lot of barbecue guys like Pat Martin and this and that you had people like Dr. Barbecue, you had, Eddie Morin from Fast Eddie that were able to, you know, make their own brands and this and that, but few and far between than compared to now, wouldn't you say, Luke? Yeah, it seems like people are really taking the advantages uh, that have come up in culture generally in the past 10 years about starting your own gig instead of taking it, taking it from a side gig to your own gig. And I think a lot of that has changed as the workplace has changed and I think, and a big thing that's really pushed it has been COVID. You know, people get, got to spend a lot more time with their passion. And I think that's going to, I think you're going to see a lot of good cottage industries come out of this. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and I think too, that as we see, you know, more and more people working remote, it also frees up that time. You know, when you're saving two, three hours a day on a commute, uh, that's two or three hours a day. You can pour into a uh, a side hustle or passion project. Absolutely. And, you know, people are taking those side passions and those side projects and they're turning them into their, that's their way of life. And it's an interesting time to be alive. <laughs> Everything's changing so fast. It definitely is. And uh, I kind of put the cart ahead of the horse there, but let's talk about where that passion from barbecue comes for you and kind of how competition barbecue got on your radar and came became something like, oh shit, we can go do this. Yeah. I started cooking 11, 10, 11 years ago, or probably 15 years ago, uh, not competition, but cooking in the backyard for football tailgates and everything that, you know, we always, we all used to cook for. And my wife mentioned what, that. What were you her, cooking on back then? Were you cooking on gas or were you cooking on charcoal with like a WSM or something? Oh, I had a, a Brinkman Electric, buddy. <laughs> Brinkman Electric. You started out playing like the players play, son. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, my wife was telling, took the food to work one day and she was talking with her coworkers about how much I love making barbecue. And she had a coworker that told her, well, I have, my husband has a competition team. Would, would your husband like to do it? So I was like, what is this, you know, competition barbecue? <laughs> so uh, I, I went and read through everything that I could and found out that it, you couldn't use a Brinkman electric smoker as much as I love that little thing. So, uh, I got on Craigslist and started looking for Weber Smoky Mountain and found one. I'm pretty sure that it was a off the truck trailer sale, but I got a Weber 22 <laughs> for three hundred and eight dollars. Oh wow! And then I had, yeah, I had to go meet the guy, the pitmaster, and interview to be on the team. And he asked me what I cooked on, and I was like, "Well, let's go out to the car and I'll show you." And he's like, "Well, you're on the team." I said, "Well, what do you mean?" He goes, "This would be the best smoker we have." So that was pretty exciting to, uh, <laughs> and we did two or three contests a year for a couple of years. There was never a desire to change what was going on. He was from Kansas city and 
I mean, much love to him. He thought his products were great, but, you know, we weren't scoring and we weren't doing well. And I'm not built that way to continue to go do the same thing over and over again with the same results. So I basically said I didn't want to do it anymore. After that, a couple of months passed and Kim and Leanne came to me and said, listen, we really enjoyed going to the couple that we did and we would like for you to start your own team. So let's work all off season on our recipes and stuff and let's cook three contests next year and see how we do. So we went with that plan. We ended up cooking seven the first year. Ended up taking my first barbecue class, which was such a huge turning point. And then turning around in our second year. What year is this, Luke? This is 2013. Okay. So I, I got in in 07. So 2013. Okay. So class-wise at that point, whose class did you go take? For, and for people that are kind of new to competition barbecue, I would say probably about, I started in 07, so probably about 04, 05, people started offering classes, like guys that went out, won a bunch of championships. They would offer these classes to kind of shorten the learning curve on getting into competition barbecue. So by 2013, you probably had, at that point, Rub Bagby's doing classes, Donnie Bray from Warren County Pork Choppers, Rod Gray. You know, you had probably a half dozen folks that were that were putting on classes. Which one did you go to? That's a great story in itself. I got a text from Mark Gibbs from Checkered Flag 500 one day and said, Yes. I have a, I have a class entry for uh, Chris Hart with IQ up in Boston. Oh. Mm-hmm. And it's for, it's for Saturday. <laughs> this is Monday. And he's like, if you can find a way up there and find a place to stay, I will sell this class to you for 300 bucks. So he's like, I just can't go. And I was like, there's barbecue classes. I had no idea. So yeah, <laughs> I figured it all out and I had airline miles and slept in my car, flew up to Boston, slept in my car and had my mind blown. And I was just going to say, you know, Chris Hart's one of those guys. He wasn't around the scene for a super long time. He came in, he came out, you know, he came in and, and hung around, you know, and not hung around, kicked some ass for several years, and then kind of, you know, got into the restaurant side and walked away from it. But definitely in his heyday, uh, a cook you had to uh, know he was there when, when he showed up at a contest. Absolutely. And I learned more in those two days. Your first barbecue class, you learned so much. And so many small things that you can do to make your product better. And I learned so much in those two days that it really, it changed my whole perception of everything. And uh, I still maintain it's one of the best classes I've had in five months. That was in October of 2013 and 2014. We won our first grand championship, second contest after the class. So that's, uh, if there's <laughs> if there's more empirical evidence for that, then I can't. I can't find it. And also, I was just informed today that IQ and Chris Hart are going to be cooking the American Royal this year. Say, say that again? IQ and Chris Hart are going to be cooking the American Royal. Wow, man. I hate that this is going to be the first year in a long time I've missed it. That's uh, that's awesome. Good to see Chris getting back out there in the saddle. I wonder if it's going to be a, a one and done or maybe if he's jumping back in. I don't know, but I know the whole gang's coming out and it's going to be a lot of fun. Man, that is uh, that is awesome. I'm sure everybody. I mean, because it's been a while since he's since their crew's been on the scene. So I, I'm sure a lot of people will be just happy to be out there cooking with those folks. Absolutely, you're not going to be there. I am not going to be there, man. This is the uh, first year I'm going to miss. I've got a a conflict that weekend uh, around football season. Oh, so n- wait a minute, not going to make it, but uh, we'll be there in spirit. Your conflict is you are making. Smoked tilapia for Deion Sanders. <laughs> no? So you guys got to understand, no. you know, so Luke likes to, <laughs> I, I've been fortunate to, to cook for some pretty cool folks. And uh, I, I love it because Luke won't just text me like, hey, old boy, what's up? Or what's up, brother? How you been? It's like, hey, man, so are you cooking crepes for Brian Boitano right now? <laughs> and and there, there's some funny ones. I need to just post, I need to just put them to my story every time you send them on Instagram. <laughs> That, 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 it's super hilarious, but no, it's something to do with Ford and a tailgate. I can't even remember what city it's going to be in, but it's not going to be Kansas City, which sucks. No, that's you'll definitely be missed. Definitely. Yeah, and then for you guys that don't know the American Royal, it's called the World Series of Barbecue. To me, it's probably, not not probably, to me, it's the, the hardest world championship to win, just especially the 
the open and even the invitational both. I mean, in the invitational, you're looking at 150 to 180 teams that have all won a contest within the last 12 months that that had 50 teams or more. And then in the open, anybody, you know, run what you brung, you know, and that's, you know, sometimes five, 600 plus teams. And then Luke, you've, you've done pretty well there. Yeah. It's the granddaddy of them all, that contest. It's everybody in barbecue is there. And I call it, I say it's like cooking inside a barbecue snow globe and you're walking down the street and you'll see five people that you're like, wow, man, that look, that was Tuffy Stone. Look, that was Chris Lilly. And you're like, this is cool. And yeah, we've had a, a, we've had a good amount of success there. We finished in the top 10 once in the open. We won chicken last year in the open. So I'm looking forward to getting back this year. I'm going at it a little bit differently in that we've cooked the, American Royal five times now, and I've never gotten a call in the Invitational. So I'm really, I'm really going to try and take care of myself a little bit better in the days leading up. Make sure I have a lot of good energy and then and have a good cook on the first day as well. So what Luke's alluding to there in very professional speak is, it's really easy to get shit faced on Thursday and Friday night at the American Royal. Thursday night's kind of our night. It's it's the cooks' night. You know, there's no public there. You know, Snake River Farms is usually throwing a big party, big weenie roast. There's, you know, you can't walk four feet without a bottle of booze hitting you in the chest. Thursday night's kind of go night at the American Royal for comp teams, for cook teams. And then Friday is the first night of the public. And, like, there was a couple years there at Traeger that I threw some pretty big ragers on Friday night. Um, You've got other brands throwing ragers. You've got, you go way back to the old school American Royal, when it was at Kempfer Arena, you had literally a dark side and a competition side. And there were some people after 10 o'clock that went to the dark side and didn't come back till daybreak. Um, and I think that's what Luke's alluding to by saying he wants to be in better shape on Saturday. Our first American Royal, I screwed up during the registration process and we were parked on the dark side at Kempfer Arena. And you know, I didn't believe it. I went to West Virginia University. I'm like, this can't be what everyone's saying. It was. It was 100% the biggest, most debauchery-filled party I've seen. And you wake up, so Saturday morning is when people are cooking for the Invitational. And we're over there cooking in basically a zombie apocalypse. I mean, there's there's people everywhere. <laughs> there's, I mean, it looks like the largest college party in the world that just went wrong. And you're, we were the only team cooking. It was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, no, that 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 one is, you know, we got lucky the first year we went. We had been told about it. So we were on the quiet side. We went over to the dark side for a while. It was it was fun as hell. And there's just something about that contest. You know, when you when you go there and, you know, the, the, the amount of teams a year around, I've never had much success there. I think the best I've done is like 33rd overall in the Invitational. I did walk to stage one time for Matt Van's amazing – sweet potato souffle, which it finished seventh. And we all laughed because our buddy Jeremy had went to, he was taking care of the most important stuff, which was getting beer and ice. And he had went and got beer and ice, like been like 45 minutes ago. Matt Van walks around the corner and goes, what are these sweet potato souffles doing out in the sun? They're supposed to be cooling down in the cooler. Jeremy's like, oh shit, my bad dude. We didn't have room for those and the beer and ice. And so literally, I just took those warm-ass souffles, put them right to the box, and they got seven. <laughs> Out of like 150 entries, I'm like, dude, somebody probably caught some salmonella or something off that shit from sitting out there in the sunlight so damn long. Uh, you got four. So I got a little bubble gut. <laughs> but yeah, man, the, the, the royal some some damn fun times. So you're talking about you go out there and, you, you know, your, your third contest overall, you know, second one after the class with Chris Hart. You, you you lick it, which makes people like me just sick to my stomach. Because I want to say it was like two years before I got a win in the backyard, amateur division, and then probably, let's see, 09. Probably took me another year to get a grand. Well, actually, I got my first grand after my first class, the the, 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 the contest right after my first class, which was a Rub Bagby from Swamp Boys. And uh, that was my first GC. And that was Pig in the Pond in Claremont in 2010. And there's an amazing story that comes out of it. Luke's had to hear me tell it too many times. But maybe on this podcast coming up with Tim Malloy, I'll drop it out there. 
and uh, tell oh, that boy. tell that story. You definitely don't want to miss the uh, Claremont <laughs> pig on the pond story. I got to say, it's probably one of the top ten in barbecue folklore. Is that a pretty good tease? You've heard that story, right, Luke? Oh, it's great, and you don't want to miss the Tim Malloy podcast ever. I heard you had a great one with him there in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. In Greenwood, yeah. He, uh, <laughs> we did it under the threat of a giant thunderstorm and also a lot of fireball. It was a really good, really good interview. <laughs> I heard he actually had a, a prescription delivered too. Flew in. Oh yeah, it's. <laughs> It's an amazing podcast. You know, you got to watch the medicine. You got to keep track of it. You can't, you can't lose it. Well, you know, I, I was sitting here and Malloy just texted and reminded me it was so easy to gloss over. You know, in, in my first contest, when I went out and cooked, I cooked in the amateur division. There was nine teams. I finished seventh and lost to a troop of Boy Scouts. I just, you know, no, but I, I, did, I, I was competing in the barbecue Mecca of Florida, you know, not up there in Virginia. That's how mine kind of started out, old boy. Yeah, the barbecue Mecca of Florida. Let's just go with that. But, you know, I, I will say, you look at competition barbecue up here in about 2013 to 2017, mm-hmm. we had some Slayer teams. Oh, well, there's still some damn good teams that go make noise in Florida now, but, you know, and you still got those, you know, Tim from Backyard Bros that we were talking about, Matt Barber from Hawachulas, you know, Jim Elser from Sweet Smoke Q. And then back in the day, you put in Team Unknown and Rub and Dana Hillis and all those guys, and man, that was. And, and then what used to be fun was, and you did, you know, you met us at a couple of these, is the way we used to travel. I mean, we'd sometimes travel five or six Florida teams deep out to the WFC or to the Royal, and man, that that shit made it fun. Oh, absolutely, and we've always had a blast coming down to Florida to cook. The hospitality is unmatched. The people are unmatched, and. I'm looking forward to my Florida swing this January. It's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, no, that's going to be awesome. You're coming down and doing Lake Wells and Lakeland, right? And then maybe we're going to try to throw a class in there at the uh, new Whiskey Mint Worldwide Headquarters. Absolutely. Awesome. Which I do. I, I do think, obviously, as, as time goes on, I can give you more detail. But I do think all that's going to work out. Because it looks like we should get occupancy right before the new year. Oh, cool. Very exciting. Huh? Based on the build-out plans and all that stuff, looks like we should have that done. That's going to be on North 98 Highway here in Lakeland coming in the next five, you know, four or five months. So you can start adding a day to your Disney or Bush Gardens trips and swing on by. It's going to be fun. We're going to have the manufacturing facility there. We're going to have the store there. We're going to do a little old boy apparel store in store there at the shop. Oh, wow. And then we'll have our class, our podcast studio, our content creation area. Uh, and I'm going to try to keep it all as open as possible so people can kind of see and experience it all. So it should be fun. Absolutely. I've in, in planning this trip, though, I need to ask a question is, are you going to go with me to Star Wars land at Disney? You know, Luke, I'm not a big Star Wars guy, not a big Disney guy, but I am a big Luke Darnell guy. So just getting to spend the day with Luke Darnell. Yes, I would go experience Star Wars Disney with you. I will say yes to that day. I am a giant star Wars person and I can't wait. And I, and I know that Kim little G, little general can't come with me. And I asked her the other day, I said, now are you going to be all right with me going and doing star Wars at Disney without you? And she goes, Oh, 100% please go do it. <laughs> she doesn't she, want anything to do. She's like, so. actually one of the silver linings of me not going on that trip is that I don't have, I don't to have to go to star Wars. Will you leave? <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny, man. Too funny. Yeah. No, but I've had fun in Florida the past couple of years, so I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. Yeah, no, we're looking forward to have you down here. Pig Fest has always been pretty good to you. And, uh, you know, I, I know it's a big deal for you to come back and always an emotional weekend, but a great weekend. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, you know, you get out there, you're, you're, you're running around. So, you know, you get that first GC. Uh, just so you guys don't know, me and Luke know each other forever, so I'm messing up on some introductions here, but... You'll hear it's referred to as Little G, Kim, <laughs> Little General. That's Luke's better half, uh, Kim Darnell. She's absolutely awesome. You can see how these two have been married so long because they're absolute peas on a pod and both just a ton of fun to hang around. So when, you know, you get that first GC, you and Little G have to be so stoked. You know, I know it a lot of, a lot of times when that happens, the next discussions around, okay, how many contests can we cook? How much time can I get off? What can we go do next? Was was that a similar discussion? Absolutely. We, especially not that year that we won because 
when you're first starting out in this and, you know, you're assessing how much this costs and how do you get time for it? And we really wanted to focus all of our energy on going to the Royal. So, but then we start thinking about the next year and it's like, okay, can we cook 25 times? Can we cook 30 times? You know, and really try and make a dent in it, try and win as much as you can. And that's, that's why this is kind of a, a great sickness because, you know, you end up, we had one year where we, we cooked 38 weekends and that's how we spent our time. And we traveled the whole country. It was amazing. And I'm going to tell you guys that the the most I ever did in a year was 25. I did 25 in eight states and it felt like two years worth of travel. And I've traveled pretty heavily the last 12, 13 years of my career. You, you, You go in putting in 38 stops you know, driving almost all of it. I mean, that, that is a, that is a true commitment, Luke. And, and I think that's where, you know, and I get on this rant every now and then, but just let, and I know you feel kind of the same way as me, but a lot of times, man, that's the shit people miss, you know, when they're out there like, oh man, you know, that they, they see you on social media and they, they see you've got a, a brand that's growing and this and that. And it's like, oh man, you know, like, dude, this shit wasn't just handed to us, man. Like you have no idea the, the roads we've ran, the, the, the the money we've put up, the, the chances we've bet on ourselves that we could go out there and we could make a name for ourselves, forge something. We just didn't pick a fucking username and start posting shit. You know what I mean? Like like we went out there and we got on the roads and when we ran and we earned it. And and then that's why I think it means so much to us. That's why that brand that you create, you know, it 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 fucking means something because you went out there and you put your blood, sweat and tears. And I can tell you before, I mean there was times that I was paying money for contests that I had no no, in my right mind, I shouldn't be taking rent money and paying for a barbecue contest just thinking I'll make that mortgage money that Saturday, but I fucking did it plenty of times. Absolutely. And Kim and I, we keep track. We've cooked in 30 states now. 30 states. And it's unbelievable. That- Dude, that, that that's impressive because, you know, you've got you've got some states that just only have like one contest a year. Yeah. And I, our year, our goal every year is to cook a new state. And yep. the one thing that we're proudest of is that it's not like we do bad when we go all over the place. You know, we've had right. success in a lot of different states and a lot of different regions. So okay. I think that's part of what how we've grown as a competition team and just grown as cooks and, okay. and just the <laughs> amount of people that we've yep. met. I mean, you know that. Barbecue is driven by the people. And the amount of people that we've met really and just great, some of them are you know, we used to say we have our barbecue friends and then our, our real friends. And now like that line isn't there anymore because a lot of our real friends are, <laughs> they're all barbecue people. And and then that's fantastic. No, that, 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 that's, that's so true, man. I mean, you look at the people you're surrounded by and, and yeah, a lot of those people that were barbecue friends, you know, that you saw on the weekend or, you know, I'd see you, you know, two, three times a year, but I mean, dude, I could probably go back through my phone. I don't think a month goes by that we don't reach out to each other, even if it's not, business or barbecue related, but just check in, you know what I mean? And, uh, and that, that to me is freaking awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of my best barbecue memories ever was sitting there and at the world food championships in Alabama with my mom and dad and you and, yep. and just my mom doting all over you. And she's like, Oh, that Chad, that Chad is so handsome. He, I really enjoy him. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> I'll never forget it, man. And I enjoyed that. That, that to me, man, I, I can see it right now. Like we're sitting there together again today. You know what I mean? And and that was just such a special weekend, you know, for 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 all of us. I mean, I mean, I, I got a I got a per, you know perfect perfect and chicken that day one, and then you go and just that day two. What were you sitting? So the, the cool thing about World Food Championships was, you know, back before they changed it a gazillion times, is you would the way I liked the format. And Luke, feel free to chime in is I liked when you cooked a KCBS contest the first day. And after that KCBS contest, you said, okay, here's the top 10 teams. These top 10 teams will now move on to the next day and cook whatever they want to cook that's not a turn-in. You know, one of the four turn-ins we've done the day before, which are chicken, uh, which is usually chicken thighs or chicken legs. Ribs, which are usually St. Louis-style ribs. You'll get the occasional baby back rib in there. And then pork butt and brisket. And Luke, you rolled out what a lobster mac and cheese. Yeah, it. Well, the fun thing about that year was, is how challenging they made that final round. They gave all of us the same smoker, the same amount of time, and and it was like 
go forth and make what you're going to make. And, you know, we'd never cooked on a deep South cooker before. So we're, I'm, we spent the whole night researching and figuring out what we were going to do. And, you know, we ended up making tri-tip. We had plans after day one of world food to get up at four in the morning, drive to new Orleans and have beignets, then drive back stop at the shed and have barbecue because we were like, there's no chance we're making this top 10, you know? Well, then we make, we finished seventh day one and we don't have anything to cook. We have no idea what we're going to do. And we ran into Brian and Shannon Turner from Muttley crew in the parking lot. And they're like, we brought these Wagyu tri-tips with us to make for finals and we're not, we didn't make it. So you guys want them. So we, we took them and went and <laughs> Leanne was like, what's a tri-tip? I was like, I don't know. We need to go research this right now. So we went and researched it and we called some people and uh, Kim and Leanne made their, their trademark uh, lobster bacon, mac and cheese. And the rest is, <laughs> you know, you and I, and I, I sat there that whole night and just drinking and, <laughs> We're on stage, and I was like, "You're like that's you, dummy." <laughs> I remember, I remember yep. like it was yesterday. <laughs> Dude, I will, I will tell you this, bro. There is no more faded than the World Food Championship Barbecue Awards because they make us sit out there through like four or five other classifications of cooking. And as barbecue guys, we just drink and drink and drink and drink. And so then, by the time you put those top ten on stage. We really don't know come here from Sikkim. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and I was I would think I was standing in between you and Matt Barber. I was in between my my Florida guys. Yeah, no Florida sandwich. Yep, and that's still one of the most surreal nights of my of, – well, it is. I mean, Kim had phoned home, and she called afterwards, and she's like, I don't – She we have to cook two days later against the, all the other disciplines. And yep. she's, she's like, I don't know what to do. I was like, well, you need to get back down here. She's <laughs> like, I looked at flights and they're like $700. I'm like, honey, we just won 10 grand. Go ahead and book it. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's a, hey, you know what? I can do the ROI on that. It's not paid for girl. <laughs> so she, she got home. Her mom met her at the house, did all of her laundry. She went work the next day, got on a plane after work. And Mike Richter pick, picked her up at the airport and brought her back. So it was, Super cool. Dude, Mike Richter, man. Have you talked to that guy lately? How's he doing? I did. I talked to him on Sunday. It was his birthday. Awesome. He doing good? Last week, yeah. He is still very heavily involved with uh, Operation Barbecue Relief, and they have been deployed in Kentucky for the flooding that's been going on there. And he was going back up there to pack that up and get ready to get everything south for hurricane season that's coming. Man, I, I will tell you what, guys, that is one. If you want to check it out, if you're looking for a good cause to support, it's uh, Operation Barbecue Relief. You know, Stan Hayes and David Marks and all those folks over there. You know, I, I think Richter is kind of like one. Well, he's one of those like territory leads, right? Like handled in the Southeast. I think so, yeah. But yeah, that, that whole group of folks, I mean, what they've built that into and how quickly they can deploy down to the field and have thousands of meals on the ground whether it be hurricane relief, tornado relief, flooding, any kind of natural disaster, really any kind of disaster that requires a, a big strain where folks need to eat. You know, a lot of times it can even be something to where you just got a lot of first responders somewhere like like the the condo collapse, you know, in Surfside, you know, things like that yeah. where where they just pitch in where, where, where they know people need hot food. It's amazing what they've accomplished in the time that they've accomplished it. And like you said, the speed at which they can... And that just also speaks to the barbecue community as a whole, too, because it's not just the people who who are inside of bar Operation Barbecue Relief. It is pitmasters from all over the country. And if if there's a problem in your area and you can go, you go and you go and help and you work harder probably than you ever worked for days because you're just helping people. And it's it's fantastic. It's what they do is amazing. No, it really is. So, yeah, go, go over there and check it out, Operation Barbecue Relief. If you feel uh, obliged to donate, you can. If not, just take the two, three minutes to see what they do. And, and just, you know, if you do anything, just help spread the word of a of a worthy cause because uh, they definitely are. So, Luke, you're out there. You're you're, you're putting on. Yeah, this is Luke Darnell from Old Virginia Smoke. Luke, what's the name of your podcast where folks can catch you and, and, and check up on your interviews, especially that Tim Malloy one? It's uh, Pit Ma It's called Pitmaster, an Old Virginia Smoke podcast. It's available on 
all the major podcast streaming services, we really focus in on the habits and the routines of championship pit masters. And we try and vary our audience from those really seasoned pit masters to the veterans and the all-stars to even newer teams who are up and coming and try and make it not only fun, but get to know some of these guys, but also get to learn some of their tips and tricks of the trade. I've learned more from doing this podcast than should be (laughs) possible, but just talking to people and learning some of their things, it's absolutely fantastic. We're coming up on a hundred episodes, if you can believe that. Dude, that is absolutely awesome. I I still remember, and probably nobody listening to this podcast remembers, but I used to have a Tuesday night show I did kind of before podcasts were cool, I guess I would say on, Oh yeah. I did it on really shitty blog talk radio at one point. I did it on Kevin Bevington's platform for a while. I did it on Facebook. And one of my favorite shows all time was when Travis Clark, Clark, Clark crew barbecue. If you're ever in Oklahoma, stop at his place. It's absolutely ridiculously good. Travis is probably one of the most disciplined pit masters I've ever met in my life. And I'm pretty sure you would agree with that, Luke. Oh, absolutely. And Travis came on my show one night. He just won team of the year and literally laid out his cooking program for all four meats. It's probably still archived somewhere on my, on my, on my Facebook. But I mean, it was, you know, and I'll never forget Rempy calls me. He's like, dude, you want an hour over into my show? And I'm like, dude, Travis Clark was rolling out his four meat cook, cook schedule, bro. Sorry. Not going to, not going to hang him up on that one. Not going to say, Hey, can we get back at seven o'clock next Tuesday? Hell no. We're right. just going to keep rolling it. You know what I mean? Especially for laugh tracks. Yes. Yeah. For laugh tracks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. So, so you're out there, you're cooking, you're burning it up the road. You know, you, you, you've got your job going on. You and little G are balancing that out. When does the discussion happen that this is something you want to do full time between the competition and the catering and the classes and all that stuff? You know, when does when does that come up and when does that discussion start being had? It had always been in the works since about 2017, 2018, thinking about the next what's the next evolution of this? How do we monetize this? How can we make this? into something. And I'd always had it on the back burner. I had worked for trade associations in, in Washington, DC for 20, 20, 25 years. And then my mom went into hospice and I went and spent a lot of time with her. And then basically during that period had a mutual parting of ways with my employer. And it really occurred to me after seeing everything that what mom was going through that, you know, I need to really follow this and and follow my passion and this is something that I love doing. So of all times, January 2022 is when Old Virginia Smoke started it, or 2020 was when Old Virginia Smoke start uh Smoke started as a catering and vending company about 3 months before the pandemic. So yeah, uh, that was that was but not not exactly <laughs> what you'd have predicted if you go back and write that business plan again. No, it we were at the Big 12 Big Q in Kansas City for the Big 12 tournament. And all of a sudden, the whole world changed. And, you know, I'm a thousand miles from home and you don't know if you should get on an airplane or not. At that point, everything was going great. You know, we'd booked a bunch of business all summer long, weddings, rehearsal dinners, all kinds of events. And within three weeks, we lost $70,000 worth of business just cleared. And it was kind of a, uh, an old shit moment. Like, what do we do? And, you know, first time business owner, I'm like, yep. I, and I actually think that that may have helped me in the end because I was like, you know what, let's just do home delivery. Let's switch. You know, and my friend, uh, kid next door, Jake, he's 17. He can drive and deliver. We'll go up to the kitchen, make some meals, deliver them to people who, who still want good food, but, you know, a lot of restaurants still weren't doing takeout and stuff. So we did that. Started doing word of, word of mouth advertising and that that kept the lights on for a year. And it also built us up a solid customer base. So, yeah, I think being dumb in the world of business actually benefited me at that time because I didn't know I didn't know that I was supposed to do other things other than just keep trying hard. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, and there's something about being in that scrappy mindset that I just tend to like. 
you know what I mean? Where, you know, you, you, you are out there and you're, you're having to figure out a plan B, a plan C and, and just, you know, stuff like that to, to where it's not moving so smooth. Cause a lot of times it's those times of challenge and those times where you got to get real scrappy that, that that's where the real good shit comes from. You know? Oh, you, you have to dig in. Yeah. You have to dig in and you have to be creative. You got to figure out, especially if you're taking yourself as the product, you know, this just as well as anybody is you're constantly marketing and you're constantly selling something and you have to take a huge amount of pride in what that is. And you have to, you have to decide from the very beginning, how you're going to do it. Are you going to do it the way that you want it? Are you going to do the way that people expect it? Are you going to be yourself? Are you going to make any changes? What are you going to do? And so I've just tried to be the person that I was raised to be and seems to be working out so far. So that's good. No, I completely agree with you. When you can, when you can be true to yourself, stick to yourself, what's important to you, how you like to conduct business, how you like to do things. I mean, that's, that's the most important part, right? You know, and, and that way, well, that's how you sleep well at night. You know, when you're true to yourself and, and true to who you are and, and that kind of deal, to me, that's, that's what means the most. And you want your brand to be a representation of who you are and your values and what you do. You know, if you're doing it for any other reason than that, then you just, you know, like greeting mon- monger, muddy honger and, you know, hey, it's going to be that, that's fine. But, you know, I just would prefer to, you got you to gotta be super rich in life. Just be comfortable and get to be yourself and have experiences and leave the world a little better place than where you started. Yeah. It's, you know, I made a mistake this upcoming weekend. I double booked the food truck and I just refused to cancel either. I'm not going to do it. Also, you're just going to get out there and grind it up. So I'm going to figure out a way. Hey, that Tim Boyce said he's up in this weekend. You can tell him very slowly. It'd be amazing. I'm not <laughs> sure how much we'd sell. I mean, he said, he said, he said, all, he said, all it costs is, is a, is a handle of a fireball and a handle of Tito's. They'll be there. We, we can make that happen. And two flying scripts. <laughs> we got all the scripts that he needs. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> oh, man. So you jump out there. It's COVID time. You, you, you're scrapping, you're finding ways to, to make things happen, keeping old Virginia smoke rolling. And then the dust settles a little bit. And, um, you know, you get back out there, contests start popping up. You're out cooking again, and then um, this badass opportunity just had came up. You know, with uh, the the Food Network, Barbecue USA. Talk to me a little bit about that. You know, having been on a couple of shows and understanding the casting process. You know, sometimes that shit takes a year, year and a half. Sometimes it takes two months. You know, who knows? It all depends on how close the production is and and how much they're really, really wanting to. Are they wanting to stage test really more for personality or for actual cooking? And so, talk to me a little bit about that process, and then. Obviously, you know, before and after the episode and how that's had an impact. Sure. It started, I can't remember exactly when it started, but they had targeted contests that they wanted to go to and then reached out to the teams that were at those contests. And of course we submitted and, you know, we, you go through a long interview process, probably two or three zoom calls, a lot of questionnaires, and they were supposed to film in Virginia uh, for barbecue gives back. And it turns out that there was a family emergency and they had to switch contests up to New Jersey. And so, you know, we had to hurry, we had to hustle to figure out who could cover our catering events that weekend and could we get up there? And we were able to get up there. And this is all it had always been a big dream of my mom's was for me to be on the food network. And that was a big deal for her. And to be able to, <laughs> to be able to go and do this and chef Simon just, is an unbelievable person. I can't speak enough about him. I've had that question more times after the show is what's he really like? And I said, he's absolutely like he would, like he is on TV. There's no, there's no putting on airs there. He, he is just a genuine guy. His laugh is contagious. He really cares about food and cares about what he's doing. The before was very nervous about how we would be uh, shown on TV and they did a great job and, and really highlighted us, which was awesome. The after has been very, it's been a lot of fun. We were out at dinner the other night, about 10 miles from the house and sitting there and this guy's just staring me down. He's just staring at me. I'm like, so I get up to use the restroom and I walked over. I was like, do, do I know you? And he goes, no, but I'm pretty sure I saw you on TV about a week ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> so and he's like, can I get a picture? And I was like, yeah. Earlier today, I was in Morgantown, West Virginia, and I went to this restaurant we always went to as a kid, or as kids, called Wings Ole, and it's not good, but they have these potato skins that are amazing, and I wanted to go have one, 
I wanted to have one because I want to steal the idea for the food truck. So I go in there and I go to one of the tables in the back. There's nobody in there. And I, my backpack's a mess. I spread stuff all out and I, I look up and, and there's this guy looking at me. And I look at him and I said, Mr. Kiger is my sixth grade teacher. Oh my goodness. And, yeah. And he looks at me and he goes, you're going to have to refresh me. And he goes, I know we were neighbors. He's like, I just can't. I was like, it's Lucas Darnell. And he, he's like, oh my gosh, I saw you on TV the other night. And so it took, he was like, can we get a picture? Took a picture with him. And then next thing you know, this other guy comes up, takes a picture. I don't even think he knew who I was. <laughs> you know, it was, it was just, it's just been that kind of response that's been people telling us how well we did on the show and how they really showcased us and our personalities. That's been, that's been amazing. We were very blessed to be on there. That That is so cool, man. And I always tell people all the time, like when you're fortunate enough to get recognized like that in public, like it's, it, if, if that ever gets old, you need to find other shit to do. You know what I mean? Because uh, to me, if somebody takes their time out to, to want to come over and talk to you just because they've enjoyed what you've done or you've inspired them a touch or whatever it is. You know what I mean? To me, that's, that's like the best shit. You know what I mean? And it's not that you are recognized, but you've had a positive impact on, on somebody's life. And they just wanted to thank you and share that with you. To me, that's, that's super cool. That's the biggest thing. You know, it's just in, in having somebody come up and ask you, you know, what can I do to make my barbecue better? And you ask them three questions and you give them three tips and, that's just fantastic because you know they're going to go home. They're going to make better food. And there's nothing better than that. If you can't cook for somebody and show them love by making them a great meal, giving them knowledge to, to make a good meal for their loved ones is about the next best thing. All right, man. So one thing that came up during that episode that we kind of got to talk about, okay. do, you re- do you really cry every time you slice brisket? A little bit. A little bit? A little bit. And I'll tell you why. Are we talking about like prison tack cry or like ugly cry? No, like, I guess prison tech cry, even though I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> like the prison tier, dude. Like, like, is it like like a single, just a couple of tears? Are we talking more like a, or is it more no. like a, the first time you watch The Bodyguard? Is no, it like that kind of like, it's a, your eyes are sweating, it's, so it's kind of like you're crying? <laughs> no, it's just like, I get, it's not even a cry, it's just I get the sniffles and a touch emotional, because... I know at that point if the first three meats are right, okay? Yep. And most of the time, those three meats are right. And if that fourth one is right, then I know that I'm in the game. Yep. I literally will make that first slice, and if it's right, I I set the knife down, put my hands on the counter, and I have to calm myself down. And I make sure that that box is perfect because brisket's one of my strongest categories too. So, like, I know that if that's right, then I'm in the game. So that's how I like to do it. You kind of having to calm yourself down or are you semi-rigid down south or is that, a, is that all still kind of flaccid? <laughs> I've yet to be aroused by it, brisket. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. I don't know really how to go from there. I mean, but I, I get excited. And I, I mean, I just get, I get, I get shaky. I get the nerves and I'm like, I just have to take a moment and, and then concentrate on what I'm going to do. And, you know, the one thing that they showed on, on this, on the TV was, on day two, when I sliced that brisket, there was a problem. I mean, I put the knife to it, both ends just kind of crumbled away. And I looked at Kim and I said, did you see that? I said, there's got some issues. Like took another slice and was like, okay. And then I'm sitting there thinking like, okay, what I could keep hacking at this thing like this or, and I always, I always crop my ends. You know, I like the way they look in the box square and everything. And I said, what if I crop it now before I slice it? And so I did, and I'd never done that before. And so I cut out, cut off the crumbly pieces, sliced the brisket, put it in the box, and the rest is history. And what Luke's talking about there is a lot of times you, you'll kind of square off the brisket and get you kind of trim it in a way to where it's the thickest part of the flat, which is where you want to take your slices out of, is nice and uniform and ready to go. And then, like for us in Florida, we always did it to where – you would you would cut you know because because you got your brisket and you know the edges will obviously get a little more done than the middle. So when we're talking about cropping it, you're just taking that quarter quarter to half of an inch on all the outside off, so that way you don't have the resistance of that dry brisket pulling against your knife while you're trying to slice through the moist stuff in the middle. So 
And, 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 that, yeah, and then you, you end up taking first place with it that day. To me, that that's the thing. And that's where you can go to a class. You can learn someone's cook schedule, all those things, man. But until you've been in that spot and you've got enough reps and enough experience to know, nope, this is what I need to do. Because you could have kept when hacking at it, Luke, that probably would have been, what, a 15 to 25th brisket that day? You know what I mean? Because you would have gotten nitpicked on the the not just the tenderness, but also the the taste. Because it would be a, a touch dry on those ends. Yeah, everything would have got hurt. And, you know, a person a lot wiser than me said, and I said it on the show when they went to commercial break, said never give up on a piece of meat. There's always stuff you can do to make it better. So I, I've i been trying to cook that way, and that was a prime example. You got, you got that old Virginia smoke, don't quit on meat t-shirt, Con? Uh, yep. <laughs> but you better. You walk away from money, son. No, I'm going to have one for you at the Royal now that you're going to be there. Well, guess I better get to the Royal then, by God. <laughs> you know what I mean? So what's uh, so what's looking ahead, man, coming off this TV show? So you, you, you're really at a high. What's the comp schedule look like? We know we got the Royal coming up at the beginning of October. I've been so out of touch with things. Has the Jack draw happened? Did you get drawn for the Jack? Is that still coming? Anything cool on the horizon, man? What can you share with us? Uh, the Jack draw has happened. We did not get selected this year, uh, which is totally fine. We got to go last year, so. I wasn't nearly as emotional about it this year or upset or anything. And I congrats to all the teams that got pulled. We- and let, let me let me explain that real quick, Luke. Uh, unlike the other world championships, the Jack Daniels and Craig me that there may have been some things change here since I really studied it, Luke. But the Jack Daniels will take, and if you won a contest, so like in Florida, back when I was cooking, there was a shit ton of contests in Florida. Like there was one year I actually went and watched the Jack draw. There were 26 Florida contests. So every winner of, the, of a contest with 50 teams or more, or it's a star is deemed a state championship. Get, oh, sorry, 35 teams or more now. If you want a contest, 35 teams or more, you get a draw into that state for the Jack. So if you win, like that year, me and Dana Hillis both won two contests in Florida. The rest of the winners were singles. There was no other doubles, right? So you had two of my bongs, two of Dana's bongs. Both of them had a two in parentheses on the outside. And then everybody else just had their number on. And they do that for every state. Florida has a bunch of bongs. Texas has a ton. Kansas, Missouri all have a shit ton. Georgia has a good good amount just based on how many contests they have in that state. So they go through. They pull every state. Well, if there was a team from South Dakota, that is no team from the state of South Dakota is represented. So that means the South Dakota bong went to a team from Minnesota. They got that draw. Then there would be a round where there had to be a team from every home state that had one eligible. So there was one point where I thought about just buying like a fishing shack in North Dakota and saying that's where Whiskey Belt was out of. But then I figured Parrothead would get the draw every year, so why waste the time? So And and that's how it goes. So a lot of it is you have to be good to get that bung in there, and a lot of it is luck to be the, you know, for me, they actually let me pull the Florida bung that year. And so I'm looking at it, and I'm like, I got a 2-26 and shot. They're holding the barrel above me. I pull it out. I see the number and I see a two in parentheses. And I'm like, holy shit, this just went from being a two and 26 chance to a 50 50 shot. Well, I was on the wrong 50. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was cool to get to go watch it, experience it, and see it. And for anybody that's interested in it, you can just, they'll let you in to watch it. You just need to call like day or two ahead and just let them know you're coming to watch it. So they put you on the guest list and, and know to look for you before they get started. But uh, it's a pretty cool experience. Yeah. It is. It's and it was so fun to go. But yeah, we've got the American Royal coming up. We've got a couple contests coming up in the weeks leading up. I call them the primers, get them ready, and then start thinking about what we're gonna we have a couple at the end of the year that we really like that we really enjoy going to. There's one in Currituck, North Carolina, uh, which is my second home basically. And I every year I, I show up a day earlier. Like the contest is on Saturday, I'm showing up the Monday before. Uh, that just could be showing up down there. I, I bet you're linking up with that damn Jerry Stevenson, and y'all out telling lies and drinking and playing golf and fishing, a bunch of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> How is old Jerry doing, man? I need to reach out to him. Jerry is doing fantastic. He recently got remarried. Uh, Good, married this summer, and he is doing great. I've never seen him happier. He's got a smile on his face all the time, and. We got to go down there for that and had a really good time, spent some time with him, and can't wait to see him again. It's been a while. so Awesome. He's still doing Redneck Barbecue Lab? That's still rolling? 
restaurant's going great. He's got another location opening up in Raleigh that is really nice. I've got to see it a couple times. It's it's going to be a beautiful place, beautiful spot, and yeah, he's doing great. You know, he's also one of those guys that really turned this into something. So, yeah, he's been a great mentor. Yeah, and uh, I'll tell you what, man, Jerry Stevenson, he's a man at a comp. You always got to have an eye on him, man. That dude just. You, know, you got guys like me and you running around being loud and bolsters. Jerry's a silent assassin. He he still likes to hang out and cut up and have fun with us, but at the end of the day, that old boy's there to put that ass whooping on you, old son. <laughs> and hey, and hey, yeah, he's going to do it, true. walking to the podium with a smile on his face the whole time. All the time. He's a gentleman like that. Breaking necks and cashing checks. There you go, baby. There you go. <laughs> cool. And so, caterings and stuff, now, now that things have opened back up, I mean, are you... Did, did you have a bunch of graduation business and, you know, wedding season wrapping up? Was that was that good to you? Absolutely. We've got pretty solid business, pretty consistent business. We're doing, we have a food truck, we have catering, we have teaching, have a podcast. We're just kind of covering all the bases. We're working on, we've had a barbecue sauce out there on the market for a little bit and we, it's got a little rebrand coming. So we're not changing the name. So don't get Why it. Are we staying with the name Rusted Mustang? Hundred percent stain with a rusted Mustang. You can't change pure gold like that. <laughs> all right, for any you guys that are wanting to uh, do it, because we all did, go to Urban Dictionary, put in rusted Mustang. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a hoot. I, I, I remember. Was it Matt Barber that dropped that on you the first time, Luke? Oh no, it was you. You <laughs> called me and said it. Matt, no, you told you me call- that, old boy. <laughs> you called me. It said, I just had a customer come in the store and explain to me what this meant. That's right. That's what it was. And and I was like, I didn't. And my brother, who's the one that did all the, the naming and marketing of it, apparently never checked it. So, yeah. And I'm definitely not changing it. It's, there's no way that's happening. I love it. So, yeah, you guys can <laughs> check that out. <laughs> Let me know what you think of the podcast comments. and of the <laughs> Now, I will say the one thing about it, the, the trademark was not to, taken. So that's good. You didn't have to fight for that one, old boy. Oh, man, that's. <laughs> oh, yeah, that oh, was good. that was one of my favorite Chad, Chad phone calls of all. You're like, yeah, I had a customer come in. And he's like, you better look this up. So I looked it up and I was like, I, was like, well, who I did, man. And I'll tell you what, see, it's the only it's the only lifetime 20 percent off discount I've ever given. Because I just said, dude, that's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate oh, sharing that. Yeah, and it's it, not a total mess. <laughs> and it didn't take that little bastard more than ten minutes to send me a message and say it was him. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's a good story. Good deal, brother. Well, uh, wrapping up, man. Obviously, I'm going to have you back on, man. I always love catching up with you, and you got a lot of stuff going on. Maybe we'll try to touch base after the royal, or if I get out to the world, maybe I'll pick a day to do a little podcast when you guys aren't busy. Dude, always great to have you on. You know, one, one thing I want to ask you before where people can find you, because I feel like, you sure. know, people always have such an interest in getting into the food business and they feel like sure. not knowing any better. They feel like catering has the least barrier of entry. If you haven't done it before, man, catering's a bitch. It, it is hard work until you get some processes put down, some procedures in place to make it just easy to replicate every single time. Two or three tips to somebody that may be thinking about going out there and trying to get to the catering business. Two or three tips. Number one, you better be magical at running a calendar and you better be accurate. Number two, and I think this is a great life lesson. There's a French term in cooking called mise en place, which means having everything where it needs to be so you can accomplish what you're doing. And I don't care what you're doing in life. Have your mise en place in place. Have it ready. So if you know that you need these 30 things to do this catering job, have that ready the day before. So you're not thinking about it. And you just think about the food, have lists upon lists, upon lists, upon lists, have all of that done. And number three, smile. These people reached out to hire you to come do their event. And that event means more to them than it means anything else. And you should be a part of that. And a part of making that successful. Don't act like it's work because what you're doing is you're helping that person see a vision for their guests. And if you do that with a smile, then that's going to make it that much better for everybody. I love it, bro. I, I, I think that's dead on. The other one I would add to that, if you don't mind, is uh, put the proper value on your time. 100%. 
because you don't want to be the guy out there slinging three sides and two meats for nine bucks. You don't want to bastardize your brand that way. Do you get as many caterers to start? No, but you're going to start getting caterings and those people, you've now set a baseline. If they've paid that premium for your food, now you've got to come through with it. And when you do, as long as you keep doing that, you will have a no problem charging that premium. To me, my goal in life always was to reduce the amount of headcount of people I'm cooking for and just be able to charge more. So be able to go into somebody's backyard and cook a really, really nice two, three course meal on the grill and charge 125, 150 bucks a head for it with some wine and whiskey. You know what I mean? To me, that's enjoyable. That, that to me, is sharing a meal with somebody that you curated, you created. Absolutely. So do not undervalue yourself. That's the number one rule. Yep. And, I, and I'll tell you, Rub Bagby was big on me with that. When I, when I first started talking to him about catering and Rub said, dude, he's like, no, nobody's going to put a value on your time that you feel is right unless it's you. And so if it's something you want to do, you're going to lose your first couple. He's like, but you'll find somebody that likes you enough and is willing to take a chance. He's like, as soon as you get those first couple under your belt at that premium price, he's like, the rest is downhill. And then, and then just make sure you're running in the right circle. You know, I mean, you know, oh. you know, if you can try to make sure you're getting the right clients that have a good network and, and can share what a great experience you provide. And that's why it also makes it so key. Like you said, point three, man, having that smile, making, making people know that you're happy to be there. You know, yeah, it's your work, but part of your work is keeping those people happy, making them feel special, make, making them feel like that is their day because in their minds it is. Absolutely. And the other thing is you mentioned surrounding yourself with people. It's surrounding yourself with the right people in the same industry as well. Absolutely. You you have to learn and you have to keep your ears open and your mouth shut. And some of the best people that I've met in barbecue have been my biggest mentors in terms of the business side. And still it, it's, day, it's like we talked about. I mean, when you were starting all this up and Darren Worth, you know, the goat of competition barbecue, you know, and also restaurant barbecue. I mean, Darren puts out a shit ton of covers a day out of his facilities. And he says, oh, yeah, Luke, fly on out, man. I'll show you how it runs. You know what I mean? Dude, that, and, that's like that, that's like being a CEO and a Fortune 500 company CEO saying, come on, dude, I'll let you have the keys to the place for a couple of days, show you what it takes to run it. That's, that's fucking insane. Yeah, I mean, he's the GOAT of competition barbecue, but I think he's more the GOAT of the business side. His knowledge base, his experience, the things that he's learned from other people, and everything that he can share with people, uh, Darren has just been, you know, we we talked for a half hour this morning about the restaurant I mentioned earlier and these potato skins. You know, <laughs> we talked about that and and how to make it and how to do it and how to do it right, how to elevate it, you know, and but also how to make it so that it's serviceable. So it and just surrounding yourself with those kind of people. I mean, last year, you know, I drove across the country and I went and spent time with uh, Chris Schaefer with heavy smoke and went and spent time with uh, Jeff Staney's group out there in Kansas city, Joe with slaps, Darren, just, just trying to learn and absorb as much as I could, you know, and, and that's super helpful. Absolutely. Brother. I, I completely agree when you can utilize that network and learn from it, regardless of your trade. Um, it's absolutely amazing. So, yeah. all right, man, I'm going to wrap us up. You give me close to an hour, which I really, really appreciate. Time gets away from us when we get to talk and it's just, what we do, I go apologize for it, old boy. But um, once again, Luke, I know we got the Pitmaster and Old Virginia Smoke podcast. Tell everybody else where they can get you at and and where you're based out of. For anybody that may be listening, looking for a little catering, how, how far do you operate on yeah. that? Oh, I go. I just did an event yesterday, three hours away. So we're based in the Washington, D.C. area in Bristow, Virginia. You can find us at oldvirginiasmoke.com. That's our website. On Instagram at old underscore Virginia underscore smoke. On TikTok, which is old Virginia smoke. Uh, Facebook, which is old Virginia smoke. And Twitter, which is Luke Darnell. And yeah, that that whole stuff. We should do a podcast on that because <laughs> social media, it's insanity. It is. It is. It, it really is. That's why I try to stay <laughs> off of it. But I take that back. I'm trying to get better at it. But yeah. Well, I got to ask. What's what's next for you? Are you going to make uh, are you going to make kebabs for Dennis Rodman, or are you going to make falafel? For- no, but I did. I, I think I think I may have already told you this, but uh, I did get the call. Looks like I'm going to get to go cook for the goat of all goats, MJ, Donnie Jupiter. 
at his at his golf course. Really? Yeah. So I'm hoping that happens. Yeah, that would that would be super super cool. Awesome, brother. Well, Luke, man, I, I love you like a brother. I uh, I appreciate the friendship and the support all the time. And uh, can't you know? Hopefully, I see you at the Royal, but definitely can't wait to spend some time together and uh, do that Star Wars thing there, doesn't here coming up in January. <laughs> but uh, once again, brother, I've always said second best thing to come out of West Virginia University besides Pac Man Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again, Luke Darnell, Old Virginia Smoke. I appreciate you, buddy. I'm behind Pac Man. Wow. You're behind Pac Man, bro. Care, I, 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 I had to get, dude. I had to keep you humble, kid. <laughs> I had to keep you humble. I'm sorry. Take care, my friend. That's a walk off. Take care. Tell little G. I, I, I said hello. Good old boy podcast. Will do, Sign. brother. All right. Best luck, Pete, bro. Thank you so much. Thank All you. All right, guys. That is Luke Garnell, Old Virginia Smoke. What a great interview. What a great time. What a great guy and even better friend. All right, folks. Until next week, we'll holler at you. Have a good one.